this of a descendant about her father. So you want to tell us his name and spell it? And yes, uh, his name was John C. Murphy. That's with a Y. And uh, he was never called John. He was always called Clint. So uh, whenever you see the records on him, it will not say his name that was used, but you will always see John C. Because the government always insists on having those names in, the, in that order. Um, he was uh, born and raised in Pemiscot County, Missouri. Uh, specifically went to Carothersville High School. Uh, Old River Town in Missouri. Uh, his uh, brother, uh, James R. Murphy, still lives there and will be very interested to know all the things that we've done here. I've, I've collected some souvenirs and things for him because he idolized his brother. Uh, he, as he says, I'm a late in life child and, and your dad was my model. And so when I was growing up, you know, he was the big high school guy and I was just a little guy. <laughs> um, anyway, um, he was a welder <clears throat> in between uh, high school and going to the uh, Army and uh, he was assigned to um, Norfolk Naval Shipyards. He built ships and when I was three months old we moved to Norfolk and lived in Portsmouth and Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, prior to his being inducted into service. And so uh, through most of the war years, uh, which I was too young to know anything about, uh, we uh, launched the ship, uh, the aircraft carrier Shangri-La. And when it went to the scrap heap, uh, my mother and I <laughs> cried over it, <laughs> which was in the, I think, the early 60s, late 70s, uh, but anyway. Then the Shangri-La was named for uh, the place where President Roosevelt said that the uh, bombers came from that bombed, um, you know, you couldn't tell that they came from an aircraft carrier because we did not want the Japanese to know that we could launch anything that close to Japan. And so uh, he said when they asked him, where did, they, where did that come from? The name seemed so odd for an aircraft carrier, you know, and he said, oh, well, that's where the, um, the bombers came from, Shangri-La, which was the name of a famous novel in the 1930s. I've always liked that name. Anyhow, he was married. Uh, my mother's name was Darlene, as is mine, but I go by Blossom because um, that's what he called me. And that's what all of his letters address me from Italy and uh, up until the, almost the day that he was killed. He's still talking about coming home to see Blossom and, of course, his wife, Darlene. This is a bracelet that says Darlene on the front. When they met, she was so attracted to him, she said, I knew that he would be the only one for me. And so I assumed that he had given her this bracelet that says Darlene. In Sid, on the back, it says Clint Murphy, Seville, and that's the high school, Carothersville High School, in 1941. And she said, oh, absolutely not. And I just learned that from her recently. She's 87 and still pretty doggone perky. Uh, she said, I gave that to him because I wanted him to remember who I was and that he was going to be mine forever. <laughs> so that's my, that's my little souvenir from their courtship. Uh, when he was called to service. Um, this is a letter from the Army saying, Dear Private Murphy, uh, and you have been recently assigned to this regiment and that we are sending you instructions. And this is from the chapel, chaplain, uh, Montgomery, Harry Montgomery, of the 87th Infantry. And he would eventually be in Company A of the 87th. This is on Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis Stationery. This is where he went, first went. Here's the envelope. And if I can read the date, uh, this is June 12, 1944. And this is Company A Rec Center, Recruitment Center, I suppose that means. Uh, 1772, Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. And he wrote this letter to his parents. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, C. E. Murphy, Crothersville, Missouri, and that, of course, were my grandparents. 
uh, and he is talking about how much his pay will be and that he will send it home and um, he had a letter from Darlene of course and she was talking about me and he says and Blossom is just as mean as ever she's just getting into everything and uh, gotta go now he was going to try to see his brother uh, C.E. Murphy Jr. who was just called Jr. they were only 18 months apart and very close. Now I have a photograph of both of them in their in their army uniforms. He was with Patton and was wounded and was being sent home and he thought he could see him you know before he was shipped out to somewhere else. And if I'm not mistaken the somewhere else I brought photographs that this is a diorama that was apparently displayed in, in front of um, Camp Roberts, California, because in the back it says Platt of Camp Roberts. So all of these tiny format photographs here are from Camp Roberts. We are assuming now um, the two surviving uh, 87th Company A gentlemen that are here today, uh, Lou Anderson and uh, Robert Coven, um, one of them was not at Camp Roberts but they were at Cap Swift in Texas and I know that that's where he trained the most because the last visit that his mother uh, that his wife my, my mother and he had together here's some training pictures I think they're just posing in front of the barracks there these pictures are not very clear and we do not know if this is Camp Swift because of the different format or Camp Roberts. It's hard to know by just what you see. All those army barracks look alike and they've all been torn down, just about all of them. So it's hard to know and I'm showing these pictures to the surviving uh, veterans that are here from his company to try to determine if that is. This is he and this is at Camp Swift. Unfortunately, and the reason we know this is not only has my mother said that's where it is, she went down on the train to Austin, Texas, and I have, I didn't bring a telegram that says arrive Austin such and such a time, Darlene. And so I have that telegram and I have the one when he was killed also. But these pictures, some of them ruined, but that's the capital in Austin. As you can see, they're not good. This is the she and there's several of her and training photographs and these by the format and the way they're printed I'm assuming are Camp Swift. Now Mr. Anderson who was in Company A my mother always thought that this was the Cotton Bowl it's a football field but Mr. Anderson says that there was a football field at Camp Swift and that they were uh, required to go to be the audience <laughs> and so maybe the pro teams were practicing out there and uh, they had to go but she has always said and by the flaw in in this uh, photograph in this film I always assumed that that was and I'm gonna have to ask her when I get home but as you can see they what a shame these are the last pictures of them together and thank goodness this one was good and this was made in Austin Texas in late 1944. This is he by himself. And this is a training manual and I believe this is from Camp Roberts though just like a lot of people will do they don't put the complete information. Camp Roberts is this is the double I've seen a number of these that have um, turned up I have one in the museum where I work in Tullahoma Tennessee and I'm actually from Wartrace Tennessee now which is just 17 miles away but we have one of these turned in by someone who found it in a flea market it also has nothing in the front that would identify the soldier but there's a map of various camps and Camp Swift is not on here but Camp Roberts is and there's a little check mark beside it and I, that's another thing that indicates to me that he probably was there and he says I am be, uh, being trained in the duties illustrated on page 14 through 19 so if you go over here and look at 14 through 19 um, Mr. Anderson who was uh, was in the, uh, the company A does not understand why all of this 
These photographs here are to do with transportation and target practice. There is actually a picture of the targets on a wire. It's very far away, but he describes on the back that these wires would just transport these big targets across and they stood way back, you know, to shoot. But then there is probably a very rare photograph in here of him and two other soldiers down in the pits behind the target holding the targets up. <laughs> not, a, not a real good safe job, I wouldn't think. But anyway, I'm a member of a heavy, heavy weapons company. And these are training, you know, examples to show you what you're supposed to do. And of course, they do show them with those um, mortars there in those pictures that are, are posed. And that looks like one of them right there. But the importance of this book is really that he got the autographs of every, it looks like. I ask him how many, the, the guys that are here, I ask him how many people would be in a platoon and he said about 30, 35. And there's at least that many autographs here starting out with um, the, uh, the officers and the non-coms and the corporal and so forth. And then it just goes to privates. And there's a number of pages here which this record really needs to go somewhere and it will have copies. I don't know that I can give this stuff up quite yet. But um, my daughter wants all the personal letters, which I left at home. I have uh, V-mail. It's heavily censored, some of it. And unfortunately for us, it's, um, it's cut out where he would say, I slept on a cold marble floor in a palace in boom it's gone <laughs> and so I'm sure I'm assuming that that's somewhere coming up from uh, they came up you know from Naples on, on the ships to just outside of Pisa and they went on up then into the mountains through Florence and whatnot but this is Newport News um, Hampton Roads bark uh, port of embarkation Camp Patrick Henry Virginia Merry Christmas what a Merry Christmas, you're going overseas, you know. Um, I, I showed this to Mr. Anderson. He said, yes, indeed, he, he did remember that and that he called his wife that night. Here's the menu. And they are having uh, young turkey, roast young turkey. <laughs> and this is Christmas in 1944. Here's something uh, from Camp Roberts, Red Skelton girl crazy and uh, it is the soldiers orchestra here and the camp special service branches and various commanders credits and whatnot and this was on a um, little out of order here uh, July 22nd through 30th so if the Jefferson Barracks one is dated June this would be the first stop right here and uh, Sunday, July 23rd through 30. Theater number one, two matinees. And I bet you they had a lot of guys wanting to see this. Uh, Red Skelton was good about doing USO type things. And somebody said he also did several shows at Camp Patrick Henry before they left Virginia. And going out of, I showed this to Mr. Anderson and he said, oh my goodness, this is your boarding pass for the ship, the ship out. I didn't realize I had that until I started going through things. I have a, a great many more things. I just couldn't chance bringing them all, you know, on a long trip. This is your birthing space. And he said, oh, I, Mr. Anderson said, oh, I was on the promenade deck. Mess line number two. So, as you tick it over and your instructions about what not to do, Carry your life jacket at all times when at sea. Never touch the airports at any time. Never throw anything overboard. Use fresh water sparingly. Put all trash in trash cans. No smoking at unauthorized time. No smoking in the birthing space and no flashlight or cameras. So that's your birthing pass. Uh, he was in the first campaign after they arrived in Italy. There are letters from him in, in January from Italy after they landed describing the trip over. There are 
a number of battlefield written letters whenever they're he's talking of what they're going to do next and of course some of that censored uh, but he went up Mount Belvedere the next as they said the night or two later after Reva Ridge and he de describes that as being a really tough scene and that they have an even tougher one probably coming up and um, he went through Corona and on the back of that he says I went through every house in Corona so they had to fight their way through check all that out and eventually he was in Castle Diano where he wrote a letter on the 3rd or 4th of March at the close of that opening campaign and then on the 9th he was killed by a random artillery from a German strong point that hadn't been cleared yet. Mr. Anderson said the foxholes were um, on the outlying areas of town. I went there in 2000 but I've never gone with the uh, reunion groups so I was simply poking along on my own trying to figure out where to go. I went to the memorial there and and the people in the town, what few there were, it was at the end of skiing season and before the summer people came in 2000 and uh, we went through Lisiano and Belvedere and had lunch I took the maps and pictures, I Xeroxed everything out of the 87th book that was sent to the family after the war, which a lot of people had, but they've gotten away. It had a, a blue raised cover hardbound book, really nice, and it is of the maps as you would, you know, see them looking out over the valley. There's little buildings and little indications of roads and such a little hard to read sometimes but it's what all the rest of the maps are based on you know that you see in, in all the subsequent books but uh, we did go up there uh, we tried to go the exact routes that were in the book um, our driver was not a local man up there but at least he was an Italian and we <laughs> not old enough to remember the war but when we got there, of course, uh, Castellano was just l l almost leveled. I mean, it, it had this little bell tower standing, and that's about it in the pictures. And I just stood in the middle of some of those towns, and you could still pick out from the pictures in the book the views of those towns. They looked the same, you know, in 2000 as they did in 1945. And... Uh, we were met by uh, several of the natives and they immediately recognized Americans are probably going to be there because they have something to do with the 10th Mountain Division and they walked right up to us and said are you from the 10th Mountain Division <laughs> and of course my daughter and son-in-law kind of hung back and let me try to talk with them because I knew more about where I was going to try to go uh, but we, did, we went down in the ravine behind like City Hall there and they showed me the memorial and then as you walked on down the snow was just melting off of there in April and the, and the wildflowers were coming up. It was just beautiful. But uh, we went on down into that ravine and um, that's where there is a um, uh, plaque on a tree that was put there when Robert Dole uh, visited there and the whole town turned out to, uh, to honor him. and. Um, of course, they didn't know where any of the uh, foxholes or anything had been. Not all of that's pretty well disappeared, so they really couldn't show us a lot. But it took them almost 50 years to get uh, their church tower that's in that picture back up. They told me they could not save it. Uh, it was too badly damaged, even though it's standing there looking, you know, pretty erect at that time. They said it was, and the church. They they had built the new church, and I went in the church and came back out and that was about the extent of the trip due to the fact that they, they called a historian, the local historian, and he had all these mementos of Bob Dole's trip. <laughs> and, uh, and he wasn't old enough to have remembered the war either. And it was just hearsay pretty much. But we sat in a little cafe, the only thing that was open due to its being Monday and the end of the skiing season. Uh, and had some coffee because it was still pretty chilly in, in mid-April. We had had trouble getting up there because there were mudslides on the, on the roads even today uh, that they took whenever they were fighting their way up there. Um, we had to take some detours when we got to Mount Belvedere. We had to 
do some uh, sachets around the left end, so to speak, <laughs> or maybe this is the right end. Uh, but the Po Valley, I mean not the Po Valley, but uh, the valley looking back toward Florence where we had come from, he wrote about how beautiful that was, the view from the top of the ridge. And he, his family was all farmers. And he wrote to his, his dad, what wonderful farmland that must be down in the valley. But it was pretty rocky and rugged up there where they were, of course, because they were nearly to the peak whenever they got to Casa Diano. But he was killed by the random artillery uh, on the 9th, March 9th. So, um, I had seen the American cemetery out the bus window whenever we were going by bus. We landed in Rome. We went to Siena and toured there in 2000. And then we took a bus to, from Siena to Florence and I had my children looking to see if they saw the American cemetery. Of course, he wasn't there then. Uh, and we did indeed see it down in a, a sort of in a ravine with all the flags flying. I said, that has to be it. It's on the left of the road as we were going toward Florence. And of course you can see you have a very clear view of the Apennines up there from Florence, a beautiful city. And uh, uh, his, a friend of his after the war brought my mother a cameo from Italy. And when I was in Italy, I bought earrings to match it. They're almost identical. So people were still making things to sell to try to uh, you know, make a living. Um, cameos that were made in the southern part of Italy, down around Pompeii, south of Rome. I found that when being in Italy, there were little cottage industries were very localized. You could only find olive uh, wood in a certain place and those cameos, there were just dozens of people selling those. And so I'm sure they were very cheap because the people needed something. In a letter he writes, in, the, in one of those last letters he writes, he sent some money some Italian money and some pictures of Mount Belvedere and different landmarks around. They were like postcards and he sent those and he said in there, I'm trying to buy Blossom some little shoes like the little children around here wear. But he said apparently there's not any extras. So the people didn't have much. But he said he did get a shave and shower in town because there were no showers. The field uh, in, the, in the field, so to speak. But uh, all of that is in letters and, uh, and trying to keep uh, yourself as well turned out as you would like it was <laughs> kind of difficult in those circumstances. And he said he wrote that his feet were always cold. It was no matter where they were, their feet were always cold. <laughs> so um, he was, as I say, uh, what they called, I guess, battlefield buried. And a man named Carl Smalley S-M-A-L-L-E-Y, whom, about whom I could find no information. I had uh, attempted to contact him about 30 years ago. Um, the letter never, there was never any result from the address that he had in the 87th book. But he wrote to my family probably five or six times and sent back a, uh, a German pistol. He was determined to get that thing back because uh, Clint Murphy had been his special friend and he wanted the family to have these things and so we have them and uh, still uh, the I have shot the pistol it would not hit the broad side of a barn it is very uh, poorly made toward the end of the war and uh, some research showed that it was probably a tank commander's pistol for very close up defense if your tank were dismantled and you had to get out of it and so he did mention tanks once in there. Um, I have never read about tanks being, German tanks being around anywhere in these accounts that are, have been published, but there must have been one somewhere because uh, he came by a pistol some way or another. So I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, I asked my grandparents when I was a little, a little girl how the body was shipped back because it was not shipped back until 1948. He was killed in 45. And she said that the government contacted them every Memorial Day before Memorial Day and asked if they would like to have flowers put on the grave and they sent money for flowers to be put on the grave in Italy 
and this was a temporary cemetery. It was not the permanent cemetery that's there now because they were just random, apparently, buried in little locations around the countryside when they, where they were killed, and I don't know the details of how they were all retrieved. However, um, my grandparents said that then after three years of sending Memorial Day flowers and Carl Smalley, who was still in, in Italy, took a picture of the grave, which was just a pile of rocks. And he said, I'm going to make sure these flowers that you're sending are on that grave for Memorial Day. So he was a very loyal friend. <laughs> and I wish that I knew whether or not he was still alive. <laughs> but uh, so uh, they wrote and said, uh, we're closing out the temporary cemeteries all around. And we're either going to move him to the permanent American cemetery or we will ship him home. And of course, they, they preferred that. And so he's buried in a little prairie cemetery in Carothersville, Missouri. And that was in 1948. And so, though I don't remember him, I do remember the funeral. And uh, they had it at home. You know, back then you had funerals at home. You didn't go to funeral homes. And so many people brought so many, uh, so much food and Everybody was patting me on the head, you know. And I have two vases from, that, from the funeral because the vases back then were uh, very nice ceramic vases. One is, one is a green urn, which I use still. They're, they have flowers in them in my house right now. And a white, a white vase that had, oh, orange glads or something. And it's funny how you remember those strange little details whenever you're a little kid, you'd think, that wouldn't even occur to you to remember something like that, you know. But uh, I do have recollection, though, that his dog tags were hanging from the end of the coffin. And my grandparents brought, bought the best a bronze coffin. And that was, they had to move all the furniture out of the living room to have the funeral. And they had the funeral at the church. Of course, the wake was what was at the house. And that, of course, back in those days was pretty elaborate. Went on for three or four days, and the family came by. Of course, the coffin was closed because he had been dead since um, 45. But anyway, uh, any questions? I mean, I don't know. I've just been oh, talking. You've done such a <laughs> wonderful job. I, I just I want to make sure you, you, we get um, there's some various stuff at the beginning. That um, you, would you spell his name? The full name. I mean, it's John. Okay. J O H N. And then C, C and, and that stands for Clint. Clint. Oh, or Clinton. Mm -hmm. C L I N T. Mm -hmm. And then Murphy. And then Murphy. M U R P H Y. And then uh, his his unit. His unit was the 87th, and it was Company A. Okay. Company and A. His rank. Oh, private. Okay. He did have a um, uh, couple of service medals which I have and we do have a patch that I cannot zero in on and I have asked uh, Mr. Myers that has the display he had never seen one like that I don't have it with me but I drew it for him we're not sure about that patch I'm, I'm going to have to do a little more research but we have the typical 10th and of course they didn't have mountain and he, I don't think he ever got that little tab that said mountain because it, in April I read somewhere that they were trying to hand them out and a lot of guys made their own. I read that in one of the displays. But by April he was dead. And so I doubt he ever had the, um, the tab on the top. However, uh, we do have a, a Fifth Army patch and um, we do have the pins that everyone's selling. There's, there's pins out on eBay. I, I can't believe how much World War II stuff's out on eBay. It's interesting. Um, however, uh, museums like I run depend on donations, and people are not donating so much anymore. They're selling. And I really think that's really such a shame. I would never sell any of this. <laughs> I would copy it or give it away, but I certainly would not, would not ever sell it. It's kind of a, a bad thing, I think. But I guess people come on hard times. They're going to sell things if they don't have a what place kind of, for it to what kind of be. Museum do you 
And do I, you take military? Um, I do. Uh, we have a huge uh, World War II exhibit, a uh, whole room full. Can you tell me about that? Well, yes. Um, the local focus where I lived uh, uh, for 36 years, Tullahoma, Tennessee. Anytime I ever go anywhere and I say Tullahoma, Tennessee, if there's any World War II people around, they will say, oh my goodness, I was trained at Camp Forrest with two R's after the Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Been a bit of controversy about that of late because the federal government doesn't. <laughs> Uh, name things after Confederate generals anymore. But anyway, um, that facility was the largest of the Army's cantonments in the states. And there was at any given time 150,000 to 200,000 men there in this little remote backwoods area <laughs> out in the middle of Tennessee. You know, I mean, it was really really quite something else and so a lot of people have relation to that as the home front of their local focus. Now after the war like all of these other camps the government closed it out and auctioned everything. Pieces of Camp Forest show up on our doorstep from time to time. A church bought ceiling fixtures and when they remodeled somebody brought us one of the church fixtures. There were a number of chapels on base and some of them were moved off intact and became churches in the community and there's just a, a, just a great deal of that camp forest material those pillow tops those pillow shams with the fringe around them i see some from camp hale in some of these exhibits but well, the camp forest ones are just out there by the dozens you see them we have five or six in the museum that local people have given us plus they had prisoners of war there they had italians and germans in the middle of Tennessee, uh, they had uh, they had German prisoners uh, uh, near my hometown in Missouri, which was just a few miles up the road from where he lived in Carothersville uh, at Conran, Missouri, which was not even a stop in the road even hardly then. Uh, but uh, some of them broke out, and when they were captured in Arkansas, they thought that they were in Mexico because they had no concept of how big the United States is. And they thought if they could get over the nearest border, they would be in Mexico, they were in Arkansas. And so they had to go back to the prison. But many prisoners of war that worked in town in Tullahoma uh, made and exchanged things. And we have a number of those exchanged things. They made bracelets and the name tags and things out of airplane aluminum leftovers. There's a, a roster of a uh, camp ball team that's been engraved on a piece of air, 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 uh, airplane aluminum. And of course I'm talking about this has nothing to do with 10th Mountain Division, but it's interesting these, these souvenir things that people will show up for and they would trade, like they would paint a picture and trade it for a box of chocolates. We have one of those pictures. Um, just the most outstanding one was brought by a reenactor who came to the museum one day and when I saw him coming down the hall I just instinctively took a back step because he had on a Nazi dress uniform, German dress uniform. Say what you will, they're pretty impressive and he comes like you know a stormtrooper down the hall and when he saw me standing outside the museum door he said uh, I have something for you that needs to stay here. And what it was was his dad was a butcher in the Kroger store. And prisoners were sent in town to work if they wanted to work for money, for a little money, uh, and then take it back to the prison at night. And this butcher gave uh, this, this prisoner uh, soup bones to make soup when he got back to camp. And he came and brought the remains of the soup bone carved into a letter opener with the man's initials carved into the tops about this long. Absolutely beautiful piece of work. I think that's one of the most outstanding things we have from the prisoner of war era. And the other one is a canteen, a canteen from Africa Corps which has a map of the camp engraved on the back with the towers, the prisoner towers, 
the guard towers. And then a map of the Africa cap campaign. That is one of the most outstanding things that we have. And it was on a canteen. So there's a lot of um, war-related things out there. In 1986, there was a statewide project called Homecoming 86, and every town chose a theme to have a development project. And one of ours was to improve the uh, Civic Center where the uh, museum is. And so that was kind of headquarters. And the Air Force, which now has Arnold Engineering Development Center on the site of Old Camp Forest, which is the largest, and named after General Arnold, Hapa Arnold, uh, is the largest test facility for uh, testing aircraft and different kinds of space and rocket things. If it's flying in space, it was probably tested at AEDC, they call it. And that's uh, on the site of Old Camp Forest. And so they helped us from the government standpoint uh, with, the, with the reunion. And we did have some World War II guys show up with things in their hands. And so I have a whole collection of patches and units that served there. And we put up a memorial and it had each unit's name um, and emblem around on a star. It's huge. It's as big as, you know, part of this room with an obelisk that goes up and it's at the old entrance of Camp Forest, which is now AEDC Arnold Center. And that's where my husband worked and he tested rocket engines and his name was Leo Merriman. He has now been dead 20 years, but he died very young. But um, that's the connection between the military, and it's remained military, but it's Air Force now, the old Camp Forest site. But that's what happened, I understand, to Camp Swift. It's gone, except for the gates. They tell me I've never been there. And Camp Roberts, I believe, is, is not there anymore either. But the Army has their way of doing things. I do have clippings, and, and this is kind of a closing it out. Um, Unfortunately, uh, my relatives did not keep the dates. I'm always telling people as a museum curator and whatnot to get these things deacidified or copy them off onto a stronger piece of paper. Uh, <clears throat> for goodness sakes, don't enclose them in plastic with them this yellow because they just that just makes a little microorganisms grow faster. And our exhibit out here in the front where they had those life magazines and those plastic bags in the sun, I thought I was going to die. And I told them, I said, if you want them to last very long, you need to get them out of those plastic bags and get them in the shade. But anyway, it says here, <clears throat> this is coming from the uh, St. Louis uh, newspa newspapers. Uh, this one is from the Globe Democrat in St. Louis. And it says, Germans, big guns batter the U.S. in Italy. And it names any number of places. I don't know why the censors bothered to take out all those things because everybody seemed to have known what was going on. It's almost as bad as today. 10th Mountain Division fighting in Italy. Advanced Allied Forces Headquarters February 25th, 5th Army. That's what this article is. And they just cut them out every time they saw them. Somebody put them away and they gave them all to me. Um, this is no date, uh, volume 97, number 175, but right in the same time period in, in 45. Elite American Alpine Division fighting in Italy, composed of winter sports experts and mountain climbers trained in Rockies. Of course, my dad was never here at Camp Hale. You know, and so that doesn't exactly cover all the territory, but you know, these are newspaper folks and they're just writing and trying to keep things um, going. And uh, they do talk about a number of other things in here. But they're talking about mountain climbers and under General Hayes, who is spokesman in the book. And then here, the last thing is April 6, 19. 45, they did merely, barely manage to keep the date on this one. And this is the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which was the paper that they would get. 
and these are war casualties from the area and this is the tail end of Missouri here Arkansas and I'm not sure what this in is for but they go down here and this is compiled from inf information supplied by the next of kin who have been notified by the war department war or navy departments and from casualty lists supplied directly to the post dispatch from these departments after they have been notified the next of kin have been notified casualties reported here are not necessarily of recent occurrence and so down in the Missouri list here is John C. Murphy and it lists my grandfather's name as the person to contact and we tried to find a man named Allen in here that was from Arkansas and killed in the same time period and he is not in this list so this was not by any means a complete list but anyway my relatives cut out everything and say <laughs> thank goodness they saved everything so I don't know do you have any other questions <laughs> thank you can you think well, of anything well, I haven't? I, you, know, I, I, you know, I was thinking ahead of time, you know. Um, I've talked on. You know, what impact you know, did the tenth, this experience with your fathers with the 10th Mountain, how did it affect you? But, I mean, you've told us how it affected you, you know, by your historian, your... your um, and I will say, and I will conclude by saying this, sometimes people have asked me, I don't understand how you can stand to do all this history stuff it just bores me to death said so how in the world did you get interested in it and I had to think about that really really hard and I think this is why because when I was growing up listening to the radio the first big international event that I can remember was when King George died and Queen Elizabeth who was in Africa at the time as Princess Elizabeth and she was up in a treehouse and this is what they said on the radio before I went to school. She went up a princess and came down a queen because her father had died in England and she was in Africa. And I thought about that and that was like what, in 1952 or something? I looked at my mother and I said, I don't understand sometimes why things happen like they do. And I think not understanding how I ended up in a war orphan and all of my friends had fathers, you know, and I didn't. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm going to have to investigate this. And, and that's how I think I set out to find out about these things. And, uh, and going backwards into the 19th century, everybody has been affected, whether they know it or not, by the Civil War. It was the watershed event of the 19th century. And the watershed event of the 20th century is World War II. There's no question it was a global war and World War One, in a certain sense was you had Lawrence in Arabia you had some intrigues going on in the Russian area and whatever uh, and you had some things in the, in the south southeast but World War Two affected everybody in the world and not equally so um, many people profited by the war and there was a lot of that going on uh, in Tullahoma, Tennessee. And one of the veterans that had fought the entire war and was gone for five years told me, and he's still living about the age of some of these older fellows. He's 90 plus. And he told me, and his wife told me, that he had talked to me more than he had ever talked to anyone else about what happened to him in the war. And one of the things that he said that I found intriguing was that so many people were so busy making a profit that they didn't even think about people were getting killed every day of the week and he said I came back I tell you Blossom to this town where everybody should have known where I was for the last five years I walked down the street and people said well Robert where have you been we haven't seen you lately as though there wasn't a war going on because with Camp Forest out there all of those soldiers were needing um, all the things that soldiers need, you know, cokes, and, and people were sleeping in. Uh, we didn't even have there weren't even phone uh, phone bo uh, booths in that place, but they had three um, movie houses going night and day, 
and people just slept in the drugstore booths and then the, they moved uh, you know uh, old train cars in and opened up restaurants <laughs> and it just an, it was an incredible uh, overwhelming experience Patton even was there in 1940 doing his maneuvers because the area around the Duck River Valley in Tennessee was determined to be about like what France would be if we had to do a D-Day and of course we did but he had his tanks out running all over the countryside in Tennessee and in fact the maneuvers went on to such an extent that all these people were so scattered out all over middle Tennessee that when uh, the army sent the payroll they couldn't find the troops and there was <laughs> I have a newspaper from Moore County where Jack Daniel distillery is that says maneuver soldiers to be paid but where are they? You know, they were everywhere, and they were going to fight a big battle, and they were, and they, they needed to be the Red Army and the Blue Army. Well, they, they handed out these ribbons, and what they forgot to do was uh, get safety pins to pin them on with. So the maneuvers didn't happen until somebody went out and found 150,000 paper <laughs> pins to pin these things on the army and they overran war trace where I now live there's pictures of the roads all clogged up where they you can't even deliver the mail there is oral histories in in Motlow State Community College I saved them from the trash heap that had been done of World War II witnesses and soldiers and even World War One soldiers that I, I collected all those up and when they decided and determined that cassette tapes were old hat I stood in front of the cabinet and I said you're not throwing these out these have got to be transferred to another medium and we have to save them well I've been retired now for three years and the library director very proudly told me not long ago that she finally had that project underway to put those those uh, cassette tapes on CDs. Now we'll see if she does it. if she doesn't. She's going to have to answer to more than me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's important to preserve your history. Do those oral interviews. Get out the deacidification. This is a simple item to deacidify. Now why haven't I done it? it all it requires is, is flat club soda and water and, and something to support that in, when it's wet and after it is soaked for a couple three days if you have mylar underneath it you would just pull it up like that let the water drain off because it would be very weak when it's wet just like newspaper always is and then you take that over there and let it dry and then with all the lignin gone out of it it will be stronger than the original paper so that's what I and everybody else need to do <laughs> We haven't done it. I noticed some of the, the blizzards. I have a blizzard. I have a blizzard. It's the, the last one, I think, that they did in Europe that has the list of casualties in it. And mine is in better shape than the ones that they had from the Resource Center up here. And we had some for sale uh, there in sad shape because they're just so orange. And that's deterioration over time. And being inside plastic, that's just going to just eat them up. You know, it's needs to be something done about them if they expect to preserve them. So I'm taking my stuff home and following my own advice. <laughs> we are, yep, we're just running out of tape. Oh, we're great. <laughs>